Next, we'll have uh, Dr. Tarjani uh, uh, speaking about uh, imaging in uh, uh, Renault Buddy's LG motor integrated. So, um, Dr. Tarjani will be doing uh, uh, imaging as well as um, orbital debridement, which was supposed to be another talk. She will be doing it, uh, let's say, uh, back to back. Okay, so uh, thanks, Rajesh, for having me on your course, and uh, it's good to see the couple of you here. So I'll try to do justice uh, to make you understand imaging in mycosis. I have no financial disclosure. You might see certain KK photographs of my patients for which you have the consent. So listed on your right-hand side are the concepts along which I'm going to talk to you. I'm essentially going to introduce the different areas in the orbit that can get affected by mycosis and how you can exactly uh, sort of uh, kind of, uh, you know, pick up uh, um, the disease in the orbit. So quintessential to NUCA is an MRI with contrast. Now, why is that? So if you look at this CT scan, okay, these are all scans along the same coronal plane of the same patient. So if you look at the bone window here, you might feel that probably there is soft tissue involvement, probably there is not, maybe just the bone is eaten up over here. But when you look at the soft tissue, you realize that yes, there's definite involvement in the medial orbit. Now take a look at the comparative MRI. It tells you that it's not only the medial orbit, but it's going right across towards the floor of the orbit. And when you add in contrast, it tells you that the whole tissue is brightening up, it's taking up contrast, which means that the tissue is alive, it is not dead. Mucor tends to produce angioinvasion. It invades the vessels and due to that, it produces necrosis uh, of whatever tissues are there in the orbit. The fat dies, the soft tissue dies because there's necrosis. There's no blood supply to that region, right? Now, what are the imaging sequences that you should ask for? So you should always ask for a MRI with contrast with fat saturated sequences. So what do you mean by fat saturation? This is an image which is not fat saturated. You see the fat over here, intraconal all white and brighten, brightened up, right? So you obviously cannot pick up whether there is any contiguous involvement along this ethmoid sinus. But when you suppress the fat or when you saturate the fat, which means fat becomes black, fat is not visible. Now can you start seeing this medial orbital involvement? So that's where fat suppression helps in picking up uh, subtle orbital disease that you might otherwise miss. And uh, subtle mucormycosis becoming uh, aggressive mucormycosis, you know, is just a matter of time. So, so you're always better off asking for a fat saturated sequence. Now the third part, like I told you earlier, is mucor by itself, mucor ales are known to be angioinvasive, which means they can enter into blood vessels. And when they enter into blood vessels, they obviously produce necrosis, right? They block the vessels. You obviously cannot see contrast. So this is the classic pathognomonic feature of mucor. So you see this is the superior ophthalmic vein over here. And what you're seeing inside it is the surrounding of the vein is all uh, white and sort of taking up contrast. But the lumen, actual lumen of the vein is infiltrated by the fungal hyphae and that's why you're seeing it black. So this is uh, angio invasion. And this particular factor of angio invasion can only be picked up if you have a contrast scan. So we've deduced that you need an MRI, you need fat suppressed sequences, and you need contrast enhancement to actually pick up the disease very well. Uh, the ideal imaging sequence you should immediately go to when you have a case of mucor is your T1 or T2 fat suppressed contrast enhanced MRI images both axial as well as coronal, and they'll show you the disease process very well. So just like the SOV is thrombosed over here, SOV has a path from lateral to medial. In the posterior orbit, it's lateral. In the anterior orbit, it's medial. Similarly, the cavernous sinus is also thrombosed over here. You see that black inside, which means there is necrotic tissue uh, inside that area. So the earliest sign, because this is a rhino orbital disease, is involvement of the nose and is actually the turbinate becoming black. So you see these turbinates, they are all white, isn't it? However, one turbinate, when you see it as black, that is the classic earliest sign of uh, mucormycosis having affected that part of the nose. So a black turbinate sign is one of the early signs to pick up rhinal, rhino part of the disease. 
Now, in the orbit, remember that the entry is not always through the sinus. It's not that the nose has to get involved and only then the orbit gets involved. The entry can be through the pterygopalatine fissure as well. And where is the pterygopalatine fissure? At the junction of the lateral wall and the floor. You see this entire track over here. You don't see that track on the other side. So this is pterygopalatine involvement along with orbital involvement because of which the muscles are thick and bulky and this fat space is obscured. So that's another thing that you want to pick up as far as the orbit is concerned. Now certain people have asked me that, okay, how do you look for the pterygopalatine fossa involvement? So I have a simple way of doing it. Go to the lower scans, the inferior axial scans where you're seeing the uh, projection of the nose. At the inferior axial scans, you're going to see the posterior lateral wall of the maxillary sinus. And along the posterior lateral wall of the maxillary sinus is the pterygopalatine fossa. So I've given a CT scan here for you to understand. So this is the posterior, this is the projection of the nose, which tells you that you're about at this level. You obviously are not at the higher level, so you're at the lower level. The maxillary sinus has started. This is the posterior lateral wall of the maxillary sinus, and that's the area of the pterygopalatine uh, fossa. So can you see a difference between the right and the left here? The left has this area of contrast enhancement, which is involvement of the pterygopalatine fossa. A little more extensive involvement of the pterygoid muscle and the pterygopalatine fossa with the classic abscess of mucomycosis, which is hyper intense on the outside and iso to hypo intense on the inside. This whole thing is a pocket full of pus and will need to be surgically removed. Right? One more image to show you the pterygopalatine fossa. So the projection of the nose, posterior lateral wall, right side, left side, see the difference between the two sides and the involvement on the left side, right? So that's how you pick up pterygopalatine fossa involvement. So this is just a schematic to show you that the orbit can get involved through several routes. One of the routes is pterygopalatine fossa, which is often missed uh, uh, by many clinicians. Now, in MUCA, when you have early orbital involvement, you may just see a little thickening of the muscles, as you're seeing on the left side compared to the right side over here, which may slowly progress to a localized abscess. Again, remember the hyper-intense with the hypo-intense inside is classic of an abscess. So this is an early abscess in the medial orbital compartment. And when you have advanced disease, you can have the entire orbit, which is a bag full of pus. So this is the hyper-intense border of the orbit with the hypo-intensity inside and tenting of the globe or a guitar pick sign. The pick of the guitar is shaped like this. So when the posterior coats of the orbit are tented, you actually know that the entire orbit is a bag full of pus which is compressing on the eyeball and hence uh, uh, this is an orbit which cannot be salvaged. Another image of that, so you see these muscles are bright on the normal side but the muscles are absolutely dead on the other side and you have this large pocket of abscess that would need to be taken care of. You can also have involvement around the nerve sheath. So you're seeing involvement around the nerve on the right side, on the left side, the nerve is okay. If you want to know whether the nerve is ischemic or not, you would have to go for a diffusion-weighted imaging. And when you have restricted diffusion, see the normal side, the nerve is highlighting. See the affected side, the nerve is not highlighting. That tells you the nerve is ischemic. The nerve is about to be dead at any point of time and you can actually correlate with vision in such patients. So if you have a nerve which is nicely lighting up and there is no diffusion restriction, you should go all guns blazing to salvage that eye. If you have ischemia of the optic nerve already, you may not have to be uh, so aggressive in orbital management. This is another patient with uh, perioptic nerve involvement and you can see that better on the coronal scan where all around the nerve you see enhancement. Quickly moving to the last few slides, this is apex involvement. So this is the normal side, see the apex is nice. Here the apex is involved, you see this white area of involvement all around. You can also see it on coronal, most posterior coronal cuts. Another scan again to show you orbital apex involvement, which is continuing towards the cavernous sinus. Now when do you say that the cavernous sinus is involved? You say the cavernous sinus is involved when the concavity of the cavernous sinus is lost. Ideally, the cavernous sinus should have a concavity or it should be straight. So if it's lost the concavity, then it's known as cavernous sinus involvement, which is seen on apical cuts. Again, concavity lost and it's convex here. And you see the obvious involvement and the contrast uptake in the cavernous sinus. Cerebral involvement, uh, most of the times we are not the experts to manage this, but early involvement is seen as leptomeningeal enhancement, which you're seeing over here. And then slowly progressive orbital involvement includes formation of an abscess. Again, the same concept, hyper outside, iso to hypo inside, suggesting an abscess in the brain. 
same kind of an abscess here in another patient in the frontal lobe of the brain. So you can, this is some resource material that you can go through in case you're interested in studying uh, imaging and mucormycosis uh, in a greater depth. Raghu, can I go ahead with the Gebreitman? Okay, so Namrata spoke about exenteration in uh, mucormycosis, and there's also another smaller surgical modality, which is localized orbital debridement. So exenteration is the most advanced form of debridement, where you're removing everything. You can have a little more localized orbital debridement for certain patients who do not have uh, uh, severe involvement in the orbit. So I'm going to show you a couple of cases. Here is a 47-year-old gentleman who's a known diabetic. He um, uh, was well controlled with whatever uh, anti-diabetic uh, treatment that he was using. HbA1c slightly on the higher side, but tested positive for COVID, required admission for dropping uh, saturation, CORADs high, CT severity score high, treated with IVMP because of the high CORADs and CT severity score, and then discharged in two weeks. However, after his discharge, he developed dental pain, right, on the right side. And then uh, he had a consult for that dental pain, and he had imaging which suggested that he has sinus involvement and rhinoorbital mucormycosis, for which he's undergone sinus debridements. But his uh, ocular complaints continued. So only sinus debridement was done. Nothing was done for the orbit. So let me show you certain uh, scans of his. So you are seeing over here a scan which is showing you what? Uh, you know, post-debridement status. Half of the turbinates have been eaten up over here. Some part of the nasal septum eaten up. And you're seeing this obvious involvement in the right orbit, not in the left orbit, where you see this extraconal involvement slowly going on towards the intraconal. But look at this. This is an hyperintense area with hypointensity inside, which is a small abscess which is lurking there. So even though the eye is white, this orbit is definitely involved with mucormycosis. So he had a repeat sinus debridement. You're seeing more extent of debridement here towards the pterygopalata and fossa. They've eaten up some more tissue. However, that little abscess continued to be there. That was never addressed. And then we went ahead and did an orbital debridement for him. We removed everything from there, and you can see that the floor and uh, you know all those tissues. Let me just play that again. So I'm not doing very well, considering that we have limited time. Okay. So here you can see that the the orbit looks much larger compared to this, right? That's because we've decompressed the floor. We've removed the floor and the medial wall. We've debrided all that necrotic tissue from that area. We've given the orbit more space to breathe, and we've removed dead tissue. Any black area on MRI suggests that it is dead tissue. No amount of IV amphotericin B, injection of amphi amphotericin B behind the eye is going to affect dead tissue. Dead tissue needs to be removed. It's very similar to the surgical principle of gangrene elsewhere in the body where you actually uh, go ahead and remove or amputate the dead part, right? So this is his two months follow-up. And though the straight gaze picture does not show you, the birds will show you that he had this proptosis from the orbital involvement, and that proptosis has resolved after the localized debridement that we've done for him. So you can have a quiet eye, but you can have a small abscess lurking inside, and hence reading the MRI correctly is very important. My slides are not advancing. Okay. And that's why, again, the role of fat suppression that I told you earlier. So if you have this kind of an image where you don't have fat suppressed sequences, you'll not be able to pick up that abscess. When you suppress the fat, you can now figure out that this is the area where you have a localized abscess. And hence, contrast enhanced fat suppressed T1 or T2 images are your images of choice uh, in patients with mucormycosis when they have limited disease and you're considering uh, debridement. So I just wanted to highlight a few other cases. So this is a patient who, same patient, subsequent scans, where you see that there is progressive involvement of the zygoma, and there is actually a necrotic area developing within the zygoma. And these are patients that should not be left with this kind of osteomyelitis. This is inside the bone. That part needs to be treated. You need to remove the bone. This is one more example of a patient where the frontal bone uh, is involved. You're seeing that he has some amount of ophthalmoplegia, which completely reversed following debridement and removal of that bone. I'll show you some CT scan images which will help you understand what exactly happens. So at presentation, this is the same patient that you saw earlier. There was no bone involvement. But over the course of the disease, you can see that the inner and the outer table both have got involved now. And that's the frontal bone that we removed, preserving the dura. And then following this, he had complete recovery. 
just the last case that I want to show. This is a gentleman, a very sad story of a 30-year-old who went for his wife's delivery and the entire family turned positive. His father died of COVID and he developed mucormycosis. And he was 20-20 at presentation. I don't know if that's clearly visible over here, but with a little bit of proptosis and needle orbital involvement. This was not treated given the stigma the family was going through. He started developing lateral rectus paralysis. As you're seeing over here, there was no movement laterally. And you can see that the orbital involvement is increasing with this localized black area telling you that that is dead tissue which needs to be removed. Slowly, he developed complete ophthalmoplegia, went to counting finger vision, and he was advised an exenteration because of the risk that now the disease is going towards the cerebral, uh, towards the brain. And if it goes to the brain, mortality rate is very high. So you can understand the pressure situation that he was in, having lost so many lives. Uh, but we persisted. We continued to do debridement for him. These are his uh, post-op images where you can see that the amount of involvement is slowly reducing uh, over a period of time. His clinical improvement is better. And um, at six months, he is actually 2020 again. So the ophthalmoplegia has reversed and his um, uh, vision is maintained. This is his last scan. So you might see some amount of residual disease radiologically, but you have to consider both the clinical picture as well as radiological picture to uh, make your decision. So this is a patient who we brought back to 2020, did not have to exenterate. And today, he is. this was April when he had the disease. He's completed one year. There's no mortality. So um, I'll just go through briefly our experience of 30 cases that we've done debridement for. Uh, the mean age of these patients was around uh, 47. Nearly 70% were post-COVID and diabetic, with a large majority presenting with loss of vision. 20% had no PL light, but 40% had vision more than 2030. Uh, and these were all cases where uh, an opinion for exenteration was already made for these patients, but we did not exenterate. We debrided the orbit, not once, but multiple times, injected retobulbar amphotericin B as well, following debridement. And um, at a mean follow-up of about 30 weeks, which is just over six months, six to seven months, uh, we saw an improvement in 95% with stability in 5%. None of the patients worsened. Nobody died. So that's the message that I uh, sort of wanted to give, that uh, uh, if you can read the MRI very well and you know which areas are necrotic and if they are amenable to surgical debridement, then that's the modality you need to uh, sort of go for along with retobulbar amphotericin B, if you're very confident that the cerebral disease, if there is any, is being taken care by uh, IV amphotericin B.